I've got some stories to tell y'all. I've got some stories to tell y'all. I'm listening. I've got some stories to tell y'all. I'm listening. I've got some stories to tell y'all. I'm listening. I've got some stories to tell y'all. I'm listening. I've got some stories to tell y'all. I'm listening. I've got some stories to tell y'all. I've got some stories to tell y'all. I want to hear the story. How I get older How I get older My name is Thomas Day. I was born in Dinwiddie, Virginia. I came to Milton, North Carolina to build beautiful furniture. I appreciate beauty and I believe no piece of furniture should ever be an eyesore. I bought my first piece of property on Main Street from a white gentleman. I paid cash. I wanted the successful white businessmen to know I was a serious businessman. Functionality and graceful forms are important elements in my design. I would let the wood do the talking and be my guide as how to shape and create the piece. My reputation as a master craftsman of exquisite furniture became known throughout the state of North Carolina and beyond. During my time, land and personal property, which included human assets, were the measure of a man's wealth. His wealth gave him status. His status gave him power. Power earned him a place at the decision-making table of all things around him. I wanted a position at the decision-making table. I amassed land and personal property, which included human assets. In 1850, I was one of the 10 richest men in Caswell County. And yes, I owned slaves. I owned slaves because I wanted to keep families together. I wanted to teach them a trade and they could use that trade to hire themselves out to earn money. And with that money, they could buy their freedom. They could buy the freedom of their families. I could teach them to write, to count, to read. And that was very important to me because I wanted them to read the Bible and know that God loved them. Also important to me, I wanted to deny death as being their only escape out of bondage. All of these were considered crimes. And if I was caught, I could be punished. But sometimes you have to step out on faith, especially when you feel you are beaten before you begin. But you must stay the course no matter what. Now, you won't always win. Sometimes you will.
I want to tell you about my granddaughter, Annie Day Shepherd. I'm so very proud of her. She and her husband, James E. Shepherd, are the founders of North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina. How I got over, how I got over. You know my soul looks back in wonder, how I got over. My name is Henrietta Jeffrey. I was born in Halifax, Virginia. I came to Milton, North Carolina with the ability to deliver babies. The decision for me to be a midwife came from the Lord. The decision certainly wasn't mine. I helped women, black and white, bring their precious little babies into this world. My midwife bag was always packed and I was always ready to go anywhere in any time. The good Lord taught me how to catch babies. In 1913, I had to go on trial here in Yanceville, North Carolina, because a white doctor said I was practicing medicine without a license. But I wasn't. What I carried in my midwife bag was a ball of thread, herbs, turpentine oil, sizzles, and my Bible. I made teas from the herbs to help relax the mothers. I placed the sizzles under the pillow to cut the pain. I read passages from the Bible and I prayed. I held their hands when they were in pain and I was the first to love their little ones when they came into this world. No, I wasn't practicing medicine. The judge said I wasn't either and dismissed the charges. Every Sunday I went to church and I asked the good Lord to guide me. More than anything else, prayer can do anything. Prayer is the most important thing. It was during these praying times that I was led to help start a church. That church became Macedonia AME Church in Milton, North Carolina. The AME's church mission is to minister to the social, spiritual, physically development of all people, to seek out the lost and to serve the needy. The event and experiences of your life are all part of God's plan to reveal to you his purpose and will for your life. It is good and honorable and very noble to have a cause and when you've gone, the people will honor your memory by saying, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. They won't blow. I'm going where the chilly, chilly winds. Chilly, chilly winds. I'm going where the chilly, chilly winds. Chilly winds won't blow. I've got this feeling I've got this feeling My name is Maud Gatewood. I was born in Yanceyville, North Carolina. I was delivered by a midwife, Juja, Julia Lee. Juja took my father out back to bury the placenta. He had to dig the hole deep 
so the animals couldn't get to it and eat it. After it was buried properly, Juju told my father that from then on I would be all right in life. As the only daughter of a Yanceyville sheriff, I learned to be independent early on in life. My mother aimed to raise me as a southern belle. I spent most of my life in blue jeans, chain smoking, painting in a studio alone. <laughs> so much for being a southern belle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I returned to Averett College in 1975 as a professor in the art department. So pay attention, I'm only going to show this once. When I was with the Caswell County Commission, I was the only woman. It was just me and the boys. I tried to lead them in saving old buildings. I love old, beautiful, historic buildings. It made me sad when I saw so many historic buildings being destroyed in Caswell County. In destroying these old buildings, we are throwing away a potential resource that keeps us unique. When the Thomas Day House caught on fire and was severely damaged, I knew I had to help restore it. I became a founding board member for the Thomas Day House Museum, helped raise money, and donated my Thomas Day furniture to the cause. I tried to paint about relationships, peace of mind, truth, and honesty, using my God-given talents and ability. I've got this feeling I've got this feeling I've got this feeling And it's bringing me My trade in school, my trade in school. Hey, my name is Nicholas Dillard. My trade in school, gladly in After I graduated from Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina, I spent a short time selling insurance in Fayetteville, North Carolina. My mother forcefully told me. We didn't spend all that money sending you to school so that you could sell insurance. You need to do something honorable. You need to go to Yanceyville. That's where the jobs are. She told me of a teaching position in Yanceyville, North Carolina. Teaching was considered an honorable profession. So I came to Yanceyville in 1930 with the hope of becoming a teacher. I made sure that all of my students knew that education is a privilege. I challenged them to use their farming backgrounds with its virtues of hard work to better themselves and their community. I would tell my students, it's not the log cabin that you come from, but where you're going that counts. Two years later, I became principal of Caswell County Training School. I was committed to educating our Negro children. At every faculty meeting, I shared with the teachers how important our jobs were 
I worked with the local churches and parents to ensure that our children received the best education our community could provide. If I got my ticket, my wife, a teacher, our children, and I were able to live a happy and productive life in Caswell County. The years have been gracious, kind, and gratifying for my wife, Gladys, and me. Time has allowed us to see many of our dreams come true. The dreams of providing quality education for Negro students in Caswell County. The dream of building a beautiful school, Caswell County Training School. The dream of seeing 35 graduating classes the privilege of working with spirited citizens who gave so much labor, love, and sacrifices to make our school great. And I ride if I got my ticket, Lord, can I ride? Camilla Williams was born October 18, 1919, in Danville, Virginia, during the time when Danville was a racially segregated southern town. There were state and local laws that enforced racial segregation in southern towns. These laws, better known as Jim Crow, were enacted to limit political and economic gains for colored people and to keep black and white people apart. Negroes were denied equal access to public facilities. They had to go to separate schools, live in separate neighborhoods, have separate seating on trains and buses. Yet, Miss Williams recounts a close-knitted black community and some members of the white community who supported her with encouragement, finances, and love that navigated her through the segregation maze to become a world-renowned opera singer. Camilla Williams often said that she had a wonderful childhood. She grew up among family, friends, and neighbors who were like family. Her parents instilled in their children church, education, and music. Camilla's family were active members of Calvary Baptist Church. Calvary had a wonderful religious and musical program for young people. Reverend G.W. Good, who was well respected and powerful in the community, was the pastor. When Camilla was about 12 years old and had finished a solo, he said to the congregation, the voice you just heard, one day, that voice will be heard around the world. Can I get an amen? In high school, Camilla was constantly called upon to perform for different programs, and this made her a popular girl. She graduated from John M. Langston High School as class valedictorian in 1937. After high school, she went to Virginia State College for Negroes in Petersburg, Virginia. Throughout her years at Virginia State College, she sang with the a cappella choir, under the direction of Mr. J. Harold Montague. She graduated top of her class in 1941 with a Bachelor of Science degree in music. After graduating from Virginia State College, Camilla returned to Danville to teach third grade music at Westmoreland Elementary. Teaching was considered an honorable profession for young, educated Negroes, but Camilla wanted to sing. 
She wanted to continue taking voice lessons. She was encouraged by the Philadelphia chapter of the Virginia State College Alumni Association to come to Philadelphia, and they would help her financially. To earn money for voice lessons, she entered the Marian Anderson Award Competition and won two years in a row in 1943 and 1944. She began taking voice lessons with Madame Marion Freshel. After giving a concert in Stamford, Connecticut in 1945, Camilla was introduced to Geraldine Farrar, known as the world's greatest Madame Butterfly. Ms. Farrar recommended Camilla for the lead role of Madame Butterfly to Mr. Laszlo Halzig, director of the New York City Opera Company. Mr. Halzig auditioned Camilla and offered her the role. Camilla, being cast as Madame Butterfly, brewed controversy. Racial tension and negative perceptions prevailed, and Mr. Halzig was forced to hold another audition for the role. Camilla outsang the other girl and earned the right to be Madame Butterfly in spite of being a Negro. On the night of May 15, 1946, Camilla not only made her opera debut, but she made history. She went on to do many other operas with the New York City Opera. Although she never performed the role of Bess on stage, she sang the lead role in the first full recorded version of Porgy and Bess. While Miss Williams's musical career was thriving, so was her personal life. Charles Beavers asked her to marry him. They had graduated from high school together, went to Virginia State College together. He was successful in his career as an attorney. Charles and Camilla were married August 18, 1950, Charlie proved to be a wonderful husband. He was committed to his wife and the cause to uplift black people in this country. It wasn't easy being an opera singer during Miss Williams' time. But in spite of what she went through, she refused to let negativity be a part of her. Miss Williams had a wonderful and successful career from her childhood in Danville, Virginia, to the most prestigious opera houses and concert stages around the world. Not bad for a little black girl from Danville. Wellington was born in Yanceyville, North Carolina on Christmas Day, December 25, 1922. He grew up during the Great Depression of 1929. He learned the importance of helping his parents and six younger sisters, and the importance of hard work by working in tobacco fields with his black and white friends. Neil loved playing baseball. After graduating from Bartlett Yancey High School, he was offered a contract to play baseball for the Bi-State League. But World War II was looming, and he enlisted in the United States Army. He laughed. He said, well, we don't have a Jeep available right now for you. <laughs> and about two weeks after being on the front line with this Machine gun co uh, company, not company, machine gun squad. Squad, squad, yep. He sent for me to come to CP, and 
he says, you asked, you asked me about a, driving a Jeep. He says, we have one available for you. So that was, you know, in my mind, that was a big break. He received the Purple Heart for being wounded in action. Many years later, he received the French Legion of Honor Award for his combat services in Normandy and the successful liberation of France by the U.S. Armed Forces. After the Army, he returned to Yanceyville and was offered a contract to play baseball with the Danville Leafs. In 1947, he was named the most valuable player. He was recruited into the major leagues by the Philadelphia Athletics in 1953. One of those great moments uh, that he had was in his waning years in 1957. He was playing for the Richmond V's, and the major league club, the New York Yankees, had just won the previous World Series. And when spring training broke, they came back through Richmond heading towards New York to begin the opening day and played an exhibition in the city of Richmond against Dad's team, the Richmond V's. And the New York Yankees were managed by Casey Stengel. They had such uh, wonderful players as Mickey Mantle. Uh, they had Billy Martin. They had Bobby Richardson. Uh, it was an incredible team that played in front of about 10,000 fans, I'm told, in the city of Richmond in this big exhibition. And Dad it was in his next to last year in, in pro baseball, and in the bottom of the ninth, Dad pinch hit it and knocked a single over second base, over I think Bobby Richardson's head, and won the ball game. And they beat the world champion New York Yankees right there in the city of Richmond. And some of the stories that I remember reading in a newspaper article from 1957 included the fact that they were interviewing Dad. Uh, one of the things, he said it was a humpback liner, which he's trying to be humble and say he didn't smoke it. He didn't hit a big hard line drive. He got it over second base, and the man scored, and they won. But he, they asked him about it. His humpback liner, and Dad said, yeah, that was some smack, wasn't it? And then they, inter they said that the inter interview was interrupted because he said, excuse me, and ran back into the dugout, into the uh, clubhouse, came back out with a baseball cap and presented it to a young girl who had polio that was in a wheelchair. So I was proud of him for doing that. And the other thing that was funny about that day is Casey Stengel, the great New York Yankees manager, was so upset over losing to their farm club the AAA team, the Richmond team, that Casey walked out and didn't pay any attention and got on a, the, the Yankee bus to go back to the hotel. But after he raised his eyes and looked around, he realized that he had gotten on a Richmond City bus full of Richmond V fans who heckled Casey as he got off of the bus. Neil married Catherine Finch of Danville, and they were married for 67 years. They opened Watlington's department store on the square in Yanceyville in 1953. Catherine operated the store alone for five years while Neil played ball during the baseball season. Together, they operated the business for 50 years. My parents' business was based on agriculture. My parents' goal was to see everybody succeed. Mother and dad contributed and sponsored anything they were asked to help with with regard to the Chamber of Commerce, the high schools, etc. They wanted to help young people. Mom and dad sponsored fashion shows that allowed young people from the high schools and children in the grade schools to model clothes that they carried. And it was a joint effort with the uh, agricultural extension, the 4-H. It was always somebody wanting to work with mother and dad on a project. And I've never heard them say no. 
Neil and Catherine were devoted to the Yanceyville Presbyterian Church. Catherine was the church organist and played until the year 2020 at the age of 88. Okay, I'm sure that from the tone of my voice, it's obvious that my parents, Catherine and Neil Watlington, were my heroes growing up. They still are today. Anything positive, anything positive or recognizably good that I've done over the last 66 years is a direct tribute to them and my wife, Linda. These are people of positive thoughts. These are people that want to help others. And I learned from those three. upstairs as I showed you and my parents were downstairs and I heard them talking that night and I heard Montel dad so you know uh, Ernest my dad name was Ernest my mother name was Cordelia but everybody called her Deal for short D-E-E-L but Cordelia she says uh, I think I'm gonna march tomorrow and my father go to jail and dad said okay she said we need to support our children dad said I know he said, I think I'll march too. So Mom said, no, Ernest, I don't think you should march tomorrow. Dad said, why not? He said, you might have to bail us out of jail. <laughs> Mom told me that when she went down there and she was being fingerprinted and booked, okay, the officer, and, his, and Mom said his name was Lieutenant Riddle, okay, said to her, uh, Mrs. Saunders, why are you here? You look like a church woman. And Ma said the first thing got her attention was he said, Mrs. Saunders. Back in that time, you didn't get called Mr. And Mrs. Boy, girl, Sue, make up a name, okay? You didn't get called Mr. And Mrs. But he said Mrs. Saunders. And so Ma said she told the police officer, you know, uh, I'm not here for me. I'm here for my children and the white police officer for your children for children everywhere. No one should have to grow up in, in, in racism, discrimination, and being denied things that they're entitled to by God, okay? So that's why I'm here, okay, to make things better, to end racism, to end discrimination, segregation, to help children. I don't care what color they are, but children have an opportunity. And then my mother entered and said, ended up by saying, and yes, sir, uh, I am a church woman. My church is in my heart. I'm taking my church to jail. What cell do I go in? Okay, that was my mother. I'm gonna keep on walking, keep on talking, walking up the freedom. Come home, I'm working at Goodyear, and I'm making a whole lot of money at Goodyear, the highest paid job in, in Danville. And I heard about this job, well, Dad told me, this is job in Chatham called Community Action. I said, Community Action? He said, he said, yeah. I said, what's that? He said, I'm not sure what it is, but it is, it's something like you've been talking about all the time and, and Dr. King about helping people and poor people and disabled people and people coming out of jail and old folks, you know. I said, okay. So I went and applied for that job. Now, good year, I'm making $14,000 a year. It's 1970. Good money back then, more than teachers got paid. Apply for the job. And the man told me, says, why you want this job? And I told him, Dr. King, 15 years old, helping people, bringing people together, poor people, disabled people, black people, white people, just bringing folks together, and that's what I want to do. Fast forward again, and he says, well, this job wasn't paid $5,000 a year. And I said, yeah, no, I saw that on the advertisement. You're making 14000 and want this job for 5000 I said, yes, sir. But Goodyear is the number one industry in the world, you know? I mean, job security and everything. This is a grant program. 
this job may not last no more than 12 months, if it lasts that long. I said, yes, sir. He says, and you still want this job? I said, yes, sir. 14,000, 5,000, job security, number one revenue industry in the world, grant program, may not be 12 months, and you still want it? Yes, sir. He said, <laughs> Mr. Saunders, I'm looking at your application. I see you're a veteran. I said, yes, sir. Sir, I three years in the Army. He says, uh, this was during the Vietnam War, right? I said, yes, sir, but I'm not shell-shocked, okay? <laughs> I'm not crazy. I know what I'm doing, okay? I want this job. So he said, okay. That job that was supposed to last uh, 12 months, if that long, I retired after 42 years, okay? And in that 42 years, I was the executive director. When I got the job, when I was promoted to executive director, okay, we had about 21 employees. When I retired, we had 160 employees. When I got the job, we had a budget of $900,000. When I retired, it was between 13 to $15 million every year, okay, helping people. When I got the job, it was just for Pennsylvania County only, okay? When I became director, we expanded from Pennsylvania County to Henry County, Patrick County, Franklin County, Campbell County, and Danville, helping people, helping people. I'm going to keep on a walking, keep on a talking, walking. I, I go and apply for the job at Community Action, and the person told me to fill out the application. This lady will help you over here. And this lady, I walked in to take the application. I ain't never seen such a beautiful afro in all my life. A brown popcorn blouse, a wraparound wool skirt. And I'm like, Lord, have mercy. You know, I'm single, so it's okay. And uh, <laughs> so make a long story short, uh, I'm like, eh, you know, I fill the application and this, that, and the other. I get called back for the interview, and I see that person sitting there again. And then I come back, do the paperwork, and I see the person sitting there again. I'm like, e you married? No, no, hey, me neither. Uh, uh, so long story short, uh, 48 years later, we still together, <laughs> okay? It's just been a wonderful thing for 48 years, but that, that's, how, that's how I met her, and uh, I love her as much today as I did when I met her 40. We got married 48 years ago, and just, uh, just a good thing. I'm gonna keep on a walking, keep on a talking, walking up the free. Fast forward, way. there are some people who say, no, I don't think we want him for the mayor. Okay. And so I get some calls from the state, and they're saying, we hear that you may be the mayor come January because the mayor uh, is moving to another state. That's correct. And uh, some people are wondering if the Constitution allowed that to happen. And I said, really? They said, yeah, but don't worry about it. Okay. So January 1, I became the mayor. And then um, in July of 2008, they asked me would I take another two-year term. So I said, sure. So 8 to 10. July 10, you take two more terms. Sure. 10 to 12. Two more terms. Sure. 12 to six, uh, uh, yeah, 12 to 14, two more terms, sure, 14 to 16, two more terms, no, that's it, <laughs> eight and a half years is enough. When, when, yeah, when I became uh, 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 the mayor, this was January uh, 1, 2008, city council chambers today used to be the courthouse, okay, and the mayor always sits uh, right up front, and that's where the judge sat. Okay, when he sentenced my mother to jail, when he sentenced my brother to jail, when he sentenced my mother's, uh, my mother's brother to jail, my Aunt Mildred, and the list goes on and on and on, okay, where the mayor said, well, when I was the mayor for eight years, I sat there, okay, and the same gavel that the, that the uh, judge used to sentence my mother and all the other people to prison, I have that gavel now, okay? It's at my house, all right? I got that gavel. That gavel's not gonna put anybody else in jail for standing up for civil rights, but I got that, okay? So that, that, that's important to me, and I didn't know 
at age 15 to do I'm going to keep on a walking, keep on a talking, walking up the freedom way. So I came to the house and said, you know, I want you to ride a motorcycle with me. I said, you got to be out of your mind. I don't know how to crank the thing up, let alone ride it. She said, well, I wanted, you know, to ride with my father, but he died before I could ride with him. And I consider you to be like my father. They want you to ride a motorcycle with me. So, boy, okay. So I started riding in 74, riding with her, and it was like so much fun after I got over being scared to death. And then she had uh, something called a spinal stroke. And what it was, something about a blood clot went from her leg through her lung and, and, and entered in the back of her back, and she couldn't, she couldn't ride in, anymore. And so, like, wow. So long story short, went to UVA hospital, and they took care of it. I said, well, tell you what, oh, we got a little ride. Uh, we're going to ride to Martinville, and you ride the blue one, and I'll ride. Uh, the black gold wing, and if you're comfortable, you know, then we'll get you back on the road again. So she said, well, I don't know, I'll start, but uh, I don't think I can do it. I said, but I'll try. She said, I might go three miles, maybe five, but after that, I'm going to have to turn and come back home. I said, well, is that what you felt you need to do? Do that. Well, the five miles she was going to ride ended up being 150. And she got back on her bike. Seven months later, she was gone. So my wife and I, her friend at the funeral home, making her funeral plans and all that, and her friend handed me a folder. I said, this must be something that she want done at her funeral. So I opened the folder, had signed the title over to me and didn't even tell me. Do it because it's the right thing to do. Try to help somebody else. Elevate them above you. I've got some stories to tell y'all. How I get older. Oh.